Greetings, everyone. Welcome to another live edition of Miked Up Sports, the show that goes in depth with the people who build our sports community. If you're watching us live on Facebook, thanks for joining us. Feel free to drop a comment. And as long as it stays PG, we just might read it on the air. And if you're watching us on demand through our YouTube channel, we're glad you can join us there as well. Joining me is a guest who unfortunately never got the chance to play college basketball at Wisconsin due to lingering injuries, but her journey is far from over and sports has taken her to a lot of locations and places. Uh, we are glad to have Carmen Backus, now a student at the University of Wisconsin. You may remember her as a student athlete for Chisago Lakes. Carmen, thanks for joining us. And I know you made your official announcement in December that you were retiring from competitive basketball. What led you to that decision? How hard was it to come to that conclusion? And from a mental health perspective, how have you been doing in the month or so since you announced that you were retiring from basketball? Well, thank you, Mike. It's always nice to catch up with you. So thanks for having me. Um, so there's some good questions. It was a really tough decision for me. Uh, many years coming. I hadn't played in a practice or a game since my last game in high school. And so I felt like slowly my chances of getting back and enjoying the sport as a player were decreasing. And um, I had five surgeries in four years on the same knee and I just kept having continuous problems. And I think as the pandemic has affected everyone, that space, that forced space away from sports really showed me that there's a bigger picture in life. And I want to be able to run around with my kids someday and have a functioning body. And so I think I realized through my physical and mental health, it was probably time to step away and explore some other um, opportunities and parts of my identity. And as we noted, certainly not an easy decision to make because I remember when you were just getting into varsity, there were a few scouts who were telling me, uh, keep an eye on, Car keep an eye out for Carmen. They thought, hey, she's going to go places like she's a really talented player. And you certainly were. I had the chance to cover you in a couple of games, uh, but I don't know how much you follow the recruiting sites and the hype surrounding you as you were making your way up through the Chicago Lakes program, but to go from a high potential or this, I would say, yes, high potential as far as what basketball could do for you. And then here you are on the opposite end of the spectrum, certainly not for lack of trying. You did seemingly everything you could possibly do to stay active and live out your dream of playing college basketball. But Mentally, how hard was that journey where just as you were getting ready to jump back in, another setback would creep up? Um, I think I think it's really hard. And I, I think what I appreciate from you is sharing my story, because a lot of the times the stories that get focused on are the people who do come back from a setback and things end up working out. But there's a lot of people who have every opportunity in the world and their body or extenuating circumstances just don't make it a good decision to keep pursuing that option. So I think it's it's been difficult for me, but I feel like I've needed to really reflect on my identity and my ego and realize like just being successful at a sport is not going to fulfill my life's purpose and it doesn't give me value every human has value no matter what level they can perform at um and so i think i've always believed that and i've always seen value in other people who have gotten hurt or had to retire but seeing that in myself was a much harder struggle um but i think i'm finally finding a little bit of peace um with like the the mental relief from retiring. And that's something we will explore as we continue in this podcast, something we'll explore in more detail. But with this oral history series that I put together, 
I like to start at the beginning. So for you, Carmen, do you recall the first moment or memory that got you hooked on the sport of basketball? Ooh, um, I know I played on my first team in second grade and I know I just loved it from the start. And I remember growing up and finding out about North Tartan and what AAU was. And I think I was in fifth grade and I found out that you could play all year long. And I, my parents told me, no, we're going to wait a little bit. Like we want you to have, you know, some flexibility in your schedule. And I just remember bawling in my room that my parents wouldn't let me play basketball all year round. And it was really like the first thing that felt natural for me and that I truly like my first love in life. Um, and I think it played a big impact in how my personality developed and my relationships. And I am really grateful. There's a little bit of bitter, bittersweet feelings towards basketball in general right now. But I think that, you know what, you know, it's okay to go through ups and downs with any kind of relationship. So it's kind of how this has gone for me. Well, and I will add this, Carmen, if you decide you want to stay involved with basketball. Well, I could always use another commentator or a writer or coaching. There certainly are plenty of opportunities out there, even if you can't play. And something tells me we might end up seeing you at a basketball court in another capacity at some point. We'll see. I've definitely fallen in love with the game. So I think there needs to be a little break at, at the moment in my life, but I wouldn't be surprised if I find another way to love it in the future. I wouldn't be surprised either. And your connection with basketball goes beyond what most guests have when they come on my podcast. Usually they discover it or they pick it up in the playground or they join a traveling league. But your mother is one of the team chaplains for the Minnesota Lynx. I'm not sure when she started that position, but you know, as you've grown up, you until at least until you got to college, because it's a little hard to attend games when you're in Madison and focused on your studies. But all the way through high school, you know, you got to grow up with the Lynx and you got to witness their ascendance to dynasty status in the last decade. What was that experience like for you being exposed to some of the top women's basketball athletes in the world at such a young age? I definitely was very lucky and my mom has been the chaplain for 21 years so since I was born um and I think for me it's been the relationships that I've been able to build with the players and how the players have treated my family with such kindness and I think it really showed me like you know top level athletes while they're celebrities and on a different planet in many people's eyes, they're humans too. And they have a lot to offer outside of sports. And I think that's what I'm most grateful for is just seeing and having so many wonderful role models. And, um, you know, I, I learned and I witnessed a lot of hard work and also <laughs> like women's basketball was really my family's focus. So I remember I have a younger brother and he was like, 10 at a Lynx game one time and they showed like an advertisement for the Timberwolves and he turned to my mom and he was like mom like guys play basketball too and she was like yeah well they do but it was so funny because with growing up around the Lynx like female athletes and women's basketball was just so highly appreciated um and I think that's something I'm really grateful for I've never you know I've always seen women be able to reach whatever their goals are. And I think that's been really powerful. Your mother, as you said, has been involved with the team since their inception. You mentioned 21 years. How old were you when you remember attending your first Lynx game? And what was your reaction, your emotional state, getting the opportunity to watch women play basketball professionally? Well, I'm 21 right now, so that was my entire life. Um, I think I didn't, I didn't know any different, you know, when that's part of your whole life. So it became very normal 
to me, but I think that's also how I fell in love with the game so much. Going to Lynx game was the highlight of my week and yeah, for sure. It was, it's, it was a really cool experience and I'm glad my mom's still able to have a positive impact on all the players now. Were there any relationships, any interactions, just moments that you recall as you got older and had a chance to connect with the players, you got to see them in action. I'm sure you were old enough to remember all four of their championships that started in 2011. And so all the way through your high school years, there was always the potential that the Lynx would add another title. But for you, I'm just wondering how often did you get to interact with members of the team and what that experience did for you? Um, I think the most, the, the, the moments that stand out to me have nothing to do with basketball, which is ironic, but I think we were able to provide a home environment for some of the players whose families were in other states across the country. And so for me, like when I got to see, you know, the people I would watch with thousands of fans around, and then I got to see them having Easter at my house and playing games with me and shooting at the hoop in my front yard. I think just seeing that they're real people and learning, you know, just learning from them how to be a good person was really important. I do have to ask you this, was there ever a point where you considered canceling them on tips or ways you could uh, work on your fundamentals or your form <laughs> since you were, uh, as once you got to high school, you know, now you were getting college offers or at least uh, getting that opportunity. <laughs> and as you stated, oh, that wasn't sure. the point, that wasn't your the point, but I'm like, I'm sure there was some shop talk. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I picked their brains as much as I could, for sure. What stood out the most, as you said, you, you and your family gave some of these players a chance to feel at home or at least have a connection when their families didn't live in the state. What have you gotten out of that experience? Well, I think... The WNBA, like being a professional athlete is really glamorized. Um, and I think, especially for WNBA players who don't get paid as much as NBA players and have to, well, get to, but also spend a lot of time away from their family um, playing overseas in the off season. I think I realized how important it was to create a community and an identity outside of basketball because you know, basketball is not always going to treat you well. And so I think I learned from them early on. There's a lot of pain and a lot of um, non-glamorous sides that go into being really good at something. Absolutely. And I've told many players past and present that I don't base my friendships on win-loss records, the stat sheets. You know, I have a couple of former WNBA athletes that are pen pals and you know we go back and forth once in a while when they're not busy with their jobs. Was there any advice or tips that you received from a player and I'm not trying to dig up dirt or you know what I'm saying it, it's not like oh what did what was these players like but something that they told you as you picked their brains and they helped you it sounds like every player you interacted with was glad to pass on their knowledge to you. Was there anything from a Lynx player or other WNBA players that has stuck with you? Oh, I think what I will say on that, not even like something I directly received from a conversation, but I guess recently uh, Maya Moore's decision to step away from basketball and work with social justice reform and prioritize her personal life and the, the things that she's passionate about making a difference outside of basketball. I think like when she was making that decision, I, I had an inkling that my, my knee wasn't really gonna do it for me. And so I think just seeing someone who had all the success in basketball at the tip of her fingers choose to step away from it um, and it not, it wasn't a mark on her character. It was actually something that showed, wow, like look at, we always knew she was a wonderful athlete, 
look at how amazing of a human she is. And I think that's just been really inspiring for me to be like, we can value Maya's work on the court, but look at what she can do off the court. And then look at what we all can do as athletes um, in the future beyond sports. So, I mean, that's been really, really cool for me to watch from a distance. What I found most amusing about that story and Maya's decision to step away, some of her contemporaries thought not only helping her family friend, Jonathan Irons, get out of prison, then the two get married and some of her contemporaries said, maybe the biggest flex <laughs> in sports that year, you help your friend get out of prison, then you go marry him. And I remember when Maya and Jonathan made the announcement, Jonathan was saying, are you sure about this? And Maya, you know this uh, probably from seeing her so many times when she makes a decision, when she commits to something, she goes full throttle. There's no half-baked effort, none of that, but I'm going, you can't make this up. It is, <laughs> you never know what to expect in Maya. I know a, a very private tale. person. Sorry. Definitely a fairy tale. I'm so happy for her. And really, I mean, relationships and family and love is the most important thing in life. So definitely a, a good decision. And selfishly, you do wonder what would things be like if she decided to jump back in? A lot of fans are thinking she has moved on, but no matter what, uh, she will always have a place in women's basketball history. And it's her decision to make. So I'm sure if she decides to come back, we'll welcome her. But as you were saying, a fairy tale story, you win four titles, you raise the bar for women's basketball, and then you do the same for criminal justice reform. And you can't help but cheer for Maya no matter what she does. Yeah, she's been an inspiration for a lot of people. And as you were growing up watching the Lynx win titles, I guess you were also were growing up literally, I think your listed height six foot one. So you were one of the taller figures, certainly on the Chicago Lakes team. And that led to kind of a stretch four presence from you where you could shoot the three, but you also got after rebounds. But I'm curious, Carmen, growing up, how did you handle and accept your body type? Because I imagine you were one of the taller people in your classes growing up. Yeah. Um, I think there were, there were times where I just wanted to fit in and be like everyone else. And um, it's really funny because now I live with a volleyball player who's six, seven and a basketball player who's six foot. So I have reached that point of fitting in, but I think for, for everyone growing up, especially through middle school and elementary and high school, bodies are awkward and <laughs> it's really hard to truly love yourself. But I think like realizing what your body can do for you and not how it looks, cause how it looks doesn't matter, but it, the fact that it can support you and allow you to do the things you enjoy. I think that's from my perspective now being 21 and having it all figured out, <laughs> that's definitely um, something that I'm, I'm trying to work on still because, you know, after being injured for so long and no longer playing basketball every day, my body is going through another change. And I think it's just important to learn how to love and accept that um, for whatever purposes your body can serve you. And something I thought about as you were answering that question, Carmen, and I feel kind of silly. It's like, well, Mike, think about this. You got to hang around the Lynx and several other WNBA players. So in a sense, you always had that opportunity to fit in because, you know, Maya's six feet tall, Sylvia Fowles, six foot six. So the idea that you were the tallest person, you know, didn't always apply, but you were used to that. Something I did want to follow up with, though, and this is something I often ask of my taller guests, just because I always I operate under the assumption that others who may be going through those growing pains like you did may be thinking about this. But the common refrain I hear from women like yourself is that it can be difficult to find clothes and shoes that will fit as you are shooting up in high, what was that experience like for you? 
Definitely different. Definitely ordered extra long jeans from American Eagle. That's where my roommates and I get our jeans because you can get double extra long. Um, and I think like just finding playing on AAU teams and finding other people who also were strong and tall um, really helped. But yeah, it's definitely an awkward stage. But like I said, like I'm only six foot and especially at Wisconsin, like there's multiple women who are six, seven, six, eight um, on the volleyball team. And it's just so refreshing to see how confident and like beautiful they are in their bodies. Um, so I think that's really important that like women can be strong and tall and athletic and powerful. And that's, that's good. That's also beautiful. And as we noted, you played high school ball at Chisago Lake starting in eighth grade maybe earlier, but I remember you joined the team as an eighth grader. They made state that year, I believe, with a Brianna Fernstrom, if my memory is correct. You're but right, Bree. Bree, okay, yes. What do you remember from your first varsity game? You grew up around the game. You got to watch the best woman in the world make a name for themselves. But then here you are, you have to suit up for the first time. And it's different watching games as opposed to playing in them what was that first varsity game like for you i was just so excited i remember and um what's interesting is i was always way more nervous before the game or watching a different game than when i was actually playing i didn't really have a lot of nerves i was just so excited and definitely um playing with like brie and sarah green and other really great players it was just so much fun so those first couple of years of high school and we were really really successful um and i had so many great you know juniors and seniors who took me under their wings um th those are like probably some of the best years of basketball that i can look back on and remember and on top of that just to indicate how much attention or interest you were getting from the basketball fans uh, you classed up in aau i remember covering you at an aau state tournament event and you played up a grade as far as that went so when did you sense that your talents were getting noticed um i got my first offer in eighth grade from minnesota actually and i remember that just being i feeling so grateful um that i i knew i would have the opportunity to i mean i thought i would have the opportunity to play but just that motivated me even more to strive to reach that level um so I think around seventh and eighth grade, when I started getting more attention, that was really when I realized, oh, I love this and it's fun and it can pay for school. Sweet, I'm gonna keep going. <laughs> well, I guess it still did. So even still though did, it, you yeah. didn't get the storybook ending, it you still got that achievement, something to hang your hat on. Certainly a, a scholarship is no small feat no matter where you go. And as you were getting older, of course, as you mentioned, you were dealing with a lot of setbacks. I think your sophomore year, you had a back injury and I'll never forget your junior year, I covered your game with Grand Rapids and then you tore your ACL and I was dealing with bronchitis and I didn't know it yet. <laughs> so that was just a game that if I could run back, I would. <laughs> because it yeah, was such, let's redo that one. <laughs> could we, well, uh, uh, but we can't. So <laughs> I guess we gotta go with it. Um, but I'm not asking you to like relive or relitigate every single injury in excruciating detail, but you know, what were some of the injuries you dealt with and how hard was it? I remember the look on your face when you knew that something was wrong with your knee and it's devastating for anyone to have to sit out and rehab their way back because as an athlete, you, know, you want to be out there and you, know, you want to prove to everyone why you're out there. But for you, maybe if you don't mind giving us that journey of how you had to navigate and overcome, you know, injuries to get yourself back out there. Yeah, definitely have run through the timeline a few times. Um, so my sophomore year of high school, 
I had like a stress fracture and a vertebrae in my back. And, you know, of course, at the moment, I'm devastated. Two whole months out of basketball seemed like the world was going to end. But <laughs> looking back, that was nothing. So that healed up well. And then my junior year, um, halfway through the season, I think, Athletic. or eight eight games in I think it and it was the Grand Rapids game and I remember I I missed a shot and I went to go get the offensive rebound and I was so mad that I missed oh, and no. so I like just oh, no. went for it and when I grabbed it I I came down and I felt my knee like pop inward when I landed on so, um, someone else's foot and just collapsed and I think your body intuitively knows when something's really wrong. And I think a lot of athletes think, oh, they'll never, like people tear their ACL, but it's not gonna happen to me. Like, you know, there's a feeling of being invincible and that's definitely been stripped away from me. But I think I learned a lot as a player and as a person from that. And I found a really great rehab facility and made a lot of really cool relationships um, there and I, rehab that whole year and then I played my whole senior year and I felt quicker faster stronger um just like I I had experienced a new level of work ethic through that rehab that I didn't know existed and just like a love for basketball and an appreciation for the game um so that ended up being the last season that I'll probably ever play but um I think every game I was able to go out there and just like leave everything on the court. My heart was so into it. Um, so I'm really grateful for that. And then started having like some pain after the season coming into Wisconsin. And I had a arthroscopic surgery to kind of clear out some torn cartilage, tried to recover from that, didn't work out super well throughout the summer and fall. And then in the fall, um, I had another surgery and found out my cartilage tore even more. And then, so that was three surgeries. And then the following fall of my sophomore year, um, there were like some really big cartilage defects in my knee um, to the point like I, every, every time I walked upstairs, there was pain, just big gaps where my tibia and fibula um articulated so I had what's called an um, osteochondral allograft transplant with a high tibial osteotomy and my surgeon told me like this is what we do for elderly people who have no cartilage left after you know 80 years of living um so that was by far the most painful surgery I it was that was really intense I had this machine that like passively moves my knee like this if when I put it in it and I had to do it for six hours a day um for six weeks so I was just out of it after that surgery um and I think I started to realize during that recovery that even if I reached a level of no pain um you know building my muscle back up it might not be the best idea for me to try to play again. And unfortunately, I never really reached that point of no pain and I had to have another surgery. And after that fifth surgery, I realized like, I'm, I'm gonna probably have chronic pain. I still have sharp pain, um, but I can reach a level of activity that can make me a happy, healthy person. And I can relieve myself of this like, mental burden of being face to face with the thing I love that I can't do and kind of explore other areas of my life. And I think I just really hit a breaking point where every single day I was like, I'd feel so much better if I could move on from this. And so that's when I made the decision after my fifth surgery this fall. Um, and I've been slowly getting better, but I, I can't jump, I can't run it's definitely going to be a long process just to get back to doing normal human stuff. So that's kind of the, the timeline of my, my knee adventures. I will say Carmen, I remember you did have a sense of humor about this whole situation, <laughs> joking about memorizing all of these terms that most athletes would have no idea about. 
like that one surgery you spoke of. Yeah, I feel like you have to have different ways of coping for sure. I mean, anyone who goes through tough situations, I mean, and I mean, I, I still have my family and my health and I'm very grateful for that. So I, th I think I always had to remind myself in perspective, I'm still very, very lucky, but it's hard to see that when you feel like your, your world and your identity is crumbling around you. And something else you said that struck a chord with me was having a procedure that normally is done on the elderly population. And I have watched a few stories and think one from real sports, for example, that highlight the hazards from athletes who overexert themselves, especially in a single sport. I'm not implying that was you, but you know, they put their bodies through so much wear and tear that they end up having procedures done that aren't meant for people of their age bracket. Was that, it sounds like that was a turning point, but when the surgeon tells you, we normally do this for elderly people, what kind of reaction did you get from that? I know you were working to get yourself back out there so you could play and represent the Badgers, but at the same time, I know if someone told me that I'd be going, this, this isn't, something's not right here. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think it was a reality check um, that, you know, we're, we're only given one body and we're stewards of it. And it's our job to make whatever decision is going to be best for us. And I realized this is the only knee I'm going to get. Um, <laughs> things are kind of fading away inside of it. So I think it, I mean, I, I'm, it made me pretty scared that if I wasn't smart about this, I could really mess up my everyday life. Um, so I think that, I mean, that wasn't obviously a great thing to hear, but it led me to making a rational decision instead of just being stubborn and continuing to, you know, ram my head into a wall trying to play again. And I am not about to disagree with your decision as bummed as I was, because as a fan, even though you do go to my rival school, I graduated from Minnesota, if any of you haven't <laughs> heard by now, but the friendships trump any sort of allegiance that I have to my school. So I was bummed that I didn't get the chance to see you play, but I can understand why you chose to step away because as you said, you have a long-term outlook and you want to be sure that you're still in one piece. But what was the mental health journey like? I remember when you made the announcement, you mentioned throwing up after your fifth surgery that discovered more cartilage damage, if I remember correctly. And I can't imagine it was easy for you when you had the stress fracture in your back or the ACL tear in, in your junior year that kind of led to this current situation. You spoke of the world crumbling around you. What were some of the highs and lows as far as mental health coming to the realization that you, know, you weren't going to get the same opportunities that maybe some of your peers did? Well, I think one thing I'm grateful for is through this experience, I've really become passionate about advocating for mental health and helping other people identify when, when things don't feel right and you're not yourself anymore and that it's okay to get help during those dark times. Um, I'm really thankful for my family support and my poor roommates. <laughs> they've, they've seen me in the worst of the worst conditions and stuck with me through all the tears, all the emotional breakdowns. And my boyfriend just been like a rock helping me make every decision. So I think it's surrounding yourself with good people who help you get help is super important. But I mean, I want to share like, I going to college is a huge transition being on your own for the first time, huge transition. And then my expectations not being met. So I think it was the summer of my sophomore year where I was like, I saw the doctor at Wisconsin who was in charge of our team. And I said, okay, I'm showing up to practice and crying every day because I can't play. I am losing motivation for school. 
um, my boyfriend who I love and adore, I'm like, I have nothing to say to you on the phone. Just like that flatness, that not excited about life anymore, the things that used to make me happy, nothing was doing it. Um, and I think like, I realized it wasn't, you know, something had to change. And so I started taking antidepressants and anti-anxiety medication that summer. And I think it was really hard for me because I thought I could just, you know, fight through everything. And I, I thought it was a weakness. Um, but I think I realized um, I'm still on those medications and it's really put like a safety net for my emotional state where I know when I go through these high and low times, I have a little more ability to regulate myself and stay above the line. And so I would encourage for anyone who's feeling like outside circumstances are really making it tough to feel like themselves. I mean, I think you need to get the help that you need and going to therapy. That was a really big thing for me just to be able to talk through my feelings and process with someone I trusted, like, okay, what is the best decision? How can I take care of myself through this? So I think I realized and realized how important it is to be open about mental health and get rid of the stigma and the shame around it because a lot of it's outside of our control. So I think I've grown a lot in that, but also like discovered some, you know, some dark parts of life that I didn't know existed, but then also some highs from feeling so much love and support from the people around me. So like you said, a roller coaster as we all go through, because life goes hard. Something we've all had to confront in this last year, especially with the pandemic. <laughs> For you, Carmen, you speak of something that I think a lot of athletes are accustomed to. You're used to grinding it out. You're used to navigating through obstacles. If you get hurt or if you suffer a loss, you're like, all right, what do we do to get better? So I think you do build up this sense of invincibility and not to suggest that athletes like yourself are egotistical or self-centered or they're being stubborn. You know, they're just so used to working their way through anything. And then, as you stated, you discover that you come across an obstacle that isn't so easy to overcome. And I'm wondering what helped you? You spoke of medications and finding support, but how rocky did things get for you? And what convinced you to seek help? Um, I think just that, that idea of not feeling like myself and not even knowing who I am anymore. And I think like the lack of motivation and find like the inability to get excited about anything, um, hopelessness, you know, ap apathy. And that's, those just weren't things that marked who I was, you know, I, I love life. I, I get really excited about helping people, being around people. Um, but all those things were really dampened for a while. And I know I talked to some players that graduated from the team who had gone through similar injury experiences. And they really encouraged me that to do, you know, do whatever it takes um, and don't feel shame about what you have to do to feel like yourself again. So just like that advice really made a big difference in my life. Um, kind of some people, you just need permission from someone you trust that like, you know what, it's, it's okay if you get on medication, it's okay if you need someone to talk to, or you just can't meet your, the expectation set for you for that day. So I think those things are really powerful for me. Where would you say you're at now in this journey since you began intervention last summer? Definitely feeling more like myself. Um, the medication really, really helped me. I still get upset. I'm still sad, but I have a lot of really good days. And especially right now, I think there's, you know, eight or nine good days to one bad day. Um, 
And I think that's what a lot of people experience. And I've been, I've been talking to a therapist every week for past year and a half. Um, and I think, I mean, it's hard work some weeks. I don't feel like showing up, don't know what I'm going to talk about, but I think when, when emotions go unprocessed, they can be very dangerous. And I think when you acknowledge that they're there and you're aware of the harmful things you're feeling, that's when you have true power over them. So I think I've just, and I've just become more aware of who I am and what I need. And like, I want, I, I now want to help other people find that because it's been so helpful for me. And on a related subject, that's something you've emphasized with your studies, your aiming to be a speech pathologist, and I think your major is communication sciences and disorders, and going through some of your posts as part of my prep work. Don't worry, I'm not stalking your social media to see what is Carmen okay. up to. It's, you know, okay, it's like, hey, it's been a while since we last talked, so I've got to do a little refresher, but you've emphasized when it comes to speech disorders and disabilities, that sense of understanding and it's no different with mental health as well. And so what are some of the stigmas or things that you've learned that you are trying to teach others both through your own experience and through your studies as you're learning about a lot of mental disabilities, mental disorders, communication disorders, all of that. It's, it's this strange world and it can be really tough to share who you are in that sense. And I know this from my own experiences, but a lot of these mental disabilities, they can be tough to share about yourself because there are some who think it's all in your head since there's no physical impairment. I think, I think you're exactly right. And um, you've been, have you been pretty open about your experiences um how, how what would you say you're at with your experiences because i don't i don't want to assume but i want to uh, compliment you for what i've observed from you well i didn't know we were going to turn the tables <laughs> carmen Sorry. i think you, no you know what carmen maybe this could be the backdoor pilot for your own podcast <laughs> you never know <laughs> i see what you're up to <laughs> it's that little strategy so where do I start? That's a good question. I'm not used to this. <laughs> so I'm, I guess, still in transit as far as my mental health experiences. Uh, and I've actually discussed this in some detail with my guests in the past. I had uh, Kayla Tyon from Big Lake who wanted to come on and share her own experiences with mental health and accepting her identity. And if you go way back, I guess I'm used to this sense of what it's like to be weird because I don't know if I've told you this, but I do identify on the autism spectrum. That's something I'm sure you're familiar with, with your studies. And it's not something you can pick up on now. I've had a lot of practice, but in some ways, I think I almost became too good because something I've discovered recently in my own research something you may be familiar with, the concept of masking, where, especially for those who have a speech impediment, mental impediment, if they're conscious of it, they compensate in order to present themselves as more socially desirable. Because as you said earlier, everyone wants to fit in, whether you're the tallest kid in your class, or you have a stutter, or something else that could influence how you communicate with other people. So the last thing you want is to feel isolated, but I say it almost worked too well, or I almost became too good at it because in a way I think you can overcorrect and then you just don't feel like you want to share anything because you don't want to draw attention to yourself. You don't want to be seen as making it all about me, which I think is one of the stigmas involving depression, anxiety, thoughts of suicide, all of that. It's a long winded answer, but you know, my journey's still ongoing. And yeah. I don't think, 
to use a line from one of my favorite shows, Star Trek, The Next Generation, the character Q in the series finale tells John Luke Picard, the trial never ends as a way of telling him that no matter what, there will always be an obstacle. There will always will be a challenge. It's just how you face it, how you respond to it. But it hasn't been easy for me and all the things that I was used to that would distract me or keep me focused away from this aura of darkness and despair, they're, they're not there. You know, I haven't had a whole lot of events to work in the last year with the pandemic wiping out a lot of sports events. So right now I would be in the middle of another basketball season focusing on, you know, what game am I going to cover next? Who are the athletes that are making a name for themselves? And instead you can attest to this as well, even though you're not playing, we've all had to confront some of our biggest demons that maybe we didn't want to acknowledge, but when this pandemic forces us to stay home and limit interaction, that exacerbates a lot of issues that I think have been latent for such a long time. I didn't mean to turn the tables on you, but I um, I think I had seen something on part and part of your business that you identify as a person with autism. And I think I, I was thinking about that before going on your podcast and thinking about like, my focus now in my career is to help people find their voice so they can express themselves and share all the valuable things they have. And I was just thinking about like, what an inspiration you are for people with extra obstacles, you know, with communicating socially, expressing yourself, all of those things, like you are, that's what you're doing right now. And I was just thinking like, how, how cool that is. And that inspires me. And that's what I want to help other people do now. Um, now that basketball is kind of in the rear view mirror, I, I think like those are the things that I'm gonna become really passionate about and that I'm focusing on. So I just wanted to thank you for being such a wonderful role model. Carmen, if your objective was to make me blush, I think it's working. <laughs> Looking back at your athletic career, you did get to have some fun moments. You were able to get a division one offer. Wisconsin stuck with you. I don't know how many schools kept contact with you following your injuries. And then you had a senior year where you finished third in the state in rebounds at Chisago Lakes, uh, which speaks to that double double threat that you always posed and I'd say one of your, I was on hand, I would like to think for one of your brightest moments when you knocked off uh, number three ranked Matamidi in a regular season game as you were working your way back. But what do you remember most fondly about getting the chance to play basketball and where it has taken you? It's only a matter of time before she warms up. Um, I think the biggest gift that basketball gave me is like one the relationships I built with my teammates and coaches but also it was a, a type of outlet for I think a side of my personality that I don't really show in the rest of areas of life um and when I look back at I was able to express so much aggression and passion and energy and that was really exciting to me and you know, I, I can tend to be an overthinker, an overprocessor. And when I was on the basketball court, instincts took over. My body just knew what to do. It was more of being in that flow. And I think not everyone gets to find something that gives them that outlet. And that's what I look back on the most fondly is just being able to express passion in such a physical way. Um, and like have that intensity of living life. And I think I'm gonna try to find some other areas that I can express that, but it was really cool for me to discover like, oh my, there's a different side of Carmen that comes out when she starts playing basketball. And that's just not how I am in day-to-day -day life. So I think I'm gonna try to find some other, other ways I can let her out a little bit. 
And what would you make of your time at Wisconsin? Even though you didn't get a chance to play, you, as you said earlier, you have a couple of roommates who are in athletics. Uh, there are a few uh, Minnesotans who have followed you or were there at Wisconsin. I remember your appearance on Suzanne Gilry's podcast. I don't know if she's still working on that, but Suzanne Gilry, Kayla McMorris, uh, a lot of Wisconsinites. I should say a lot of Minnesotans have made the trek over to Wisconsin. One of my good friends was inducted into their athletic hall of fame earlier this or late last year, Jesse Stomsky. So while we all joke about crossing the border and becoming a rival, you know, we've sent a lot of athletes over to Wisconsin and they've done well, whether it's in athletics or with what you're doing, working toward your goal of becoming a speech pathologist. Yeah, and like like you focused on at that question, like the people that I've had relationships with here, that's been the most impactful thing. And so I, I live with Julie Postpichliva, who's from the Czech Republic, um, and she's on my team. And I've just learned so much from her, seeing a different perspective, coming from a different part of the world. And then Julia Wollert on the volleyball team. And they've just become like family to me. And I think just like if the only thing I come out of college with is those relationships and Grace Mueller, who I lived with last year, I will be so full and so happy and set up for life. Um, and obviously, like I've gained a passion for working with people with disabilities, for helping people communicate, for mental health. Um, and all of those things I've been able to gain from Wisconsin and the coaching staff has been very, very good to me, very supportive um, of all the things I'm trying to do here. And I, it, it has been a really good experience with a lot of ups and downs. On the bright side, now you get to be a fan and whether it's football or volleyball, I know they're a powerhouse, the Big Ten all around, a huge volleyball hotbed, uh, men's basketball, uh, the women's basketball team. Uh, we, we're still working on that. I know we're getting had... <laughs> there. We're getting there. <laughs> yeah. Not quite at the same level as some of the other teams, but you know, one day, right. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. How much flack though, do you get from the Minnesota folks? Cause I remember, I think your father attended the U of M. So you represent the rival school now. And you're not the only Minnesotan, as we said before, but I have to imagine for some of the folks back home, there there's probably some fun smack talk sessions going on. Oh, yeah. I mean, my dad did track and field at Minnesota, so I was raised to be a little gopher, but I can still cheer for the Vikings and the Lynx. I'm just a Badger fan now. <laughs> it's a oh, fun rivalry. Well, that leaves me wondering what happens on football Sundays then because you're in Packers territory what is it like being a Vikings fan and go, well, while attending like Wisconsin I said, in my apartment we have a Indiana girl and a Czech Republic girl so I'm very very not in a non-judgmental football space so go Vikings <laughs> I will say this though, State Street Brats, whenever it's safe to gather again, that is a good place to check out a game. I've been through the Wisconsin campus a few times and <laughs> that is one place I love to hit up because uh, I remember going there for the first time and I'm going, this is the first place where I feel like they know how to do Brats justice. Wow, Madison would be so proud. <laughs> Well, hey, I go, you have to think I would go through Wisconsin several times when I would cover Lynx road games and I'd often go to Chicago. Well, in order to go through Chicago, you have to go through Wisconsin. Uh, so I, I can't hate on Wisconsin that much. <laughs> Madison is a really fun town. There's a lot of opportunities here. And I've been to Lambeau Field once too. So, you, and again, that owes being a sports fan. And when you're a, a fan of sports and you get to cover sports, you want to see all these different places. Uh, so that's what I enjoyed most about it. I'm curious, Carmen, throughout your athletic career, what would you say was the most exciting moment and the most embarrassing moment? Oh my, <laughs> good questions. Um, I think for exciting, definitely going to state um, in high school. 
and just like you know getting out of school and having fellow classmates get out of school to come watch our games and it seems so long ago now but those will those memories will always live very fondly in my mind and then embarrassing oh boy I've had some good air balls in my life. I think I can remember in AAU, I shot a three and it hit the side of the backboard and that one stung a little bit. So <laughs> it happens to everyone. I've heard some worse stories. Actually, Carbon, you might enjoy this. I've mentioned this a few times, but I'll share it again because I, I like to see how my guests react to this. Well, most oh exciting, well, I'll start with that first, just to build it up. But most exciting was the 2015 finals. I went to Indiana for games three and four. So I got to see Maya Moore hit the buzzer beater three to win game three in a really close game. And in my head, I'm going, did she get that off in 1.7? And I look at the tape. Oh, she did. So like, you just, you, you can't <laughs> make that up. Like, that wasn't my shot, but I got to see it. There you go. And if she doesn't make that shot, who knows what would have happened in overtime. Maybe the Lynx don't win the 2015 title. Who knows? But she made the shot. And we'll always have that part in WNBA lore. Most embarrassing. My first season as a beat writer, it was the day game. And I go into the Atlanta dream locker room, because I'd like to get quotes from both teams when I can, that's not always achievable when there's only one of you and two teams, mm -hmm. uh, but the security guard thought we were clear to go in. Uh, we weren't. And so I happened to walk in while the entire Atlanta dream roster was changing out of the uniform. Oh, Mike, I can just imagine. I wish I was there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you would have been, I think nine, 10 years old at the time. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good story that's a good one uh well let me tell you this it took me all of two seconds to realize i made a mistake and got out of there <laughs> but uh the staffers who worked as part of the like the game day crew who would handle uh linens or things like that just making sure the uniforms and everything was cleaned all of that they were still talking about it years later they're like do you remember that guy who walked in the locker room while they were changing <laughs> And you're waiting for interviews and you're like, yeah, that was me. Oh boy. And I say that because I, I feel that's something you could relate to and how awkward it would be if somebody walked into a locker room <laughs> while that was going. Yep, that's like, not a good one. But <laughs> especially it's like I'm a guy in a locker room full of women. That could have gone south in a hurry. At least we're removed from it now and we can laugh at it. <laughs> yes, well. <laughs> I guess I feel grateful that it was me, not because I wanted that to happen, but I didn't have any ulterior or like mean spirited motives. It's like, oh, no, this ain't going to work. Get out of yeah, there. You you probably got out of there as fast as possible. Oh, yes, I did. <laughs> because let's just say if I had a different attitude, I don't think I would have any. I don't think I would have the opportunities that I've had to cover women's sports. So it's like, there no, it go. probably was grateful that it was me and not somebody else who had this you're very respectful yes, yes we <laughs> well, appreciate yes. that <laughs> yes well i don't yep. want to get me too that's really it there you go <laughs> i'm trying to avoid that but uh yeah that was an embarrassing moment but every time i share that story there are some WNBA alumni that i've talked to and they all just laugh because they know what that's like <laughs> oh that's funny uh, but Another thing that I like to ask of, of you, if you don't mind, I get the breakdown book every year, but I didn't get a copy of it when you were making your way through high school. I've been doing that now more often because of how hard it is to get a hold of coaches mm -hmm. and players. Uh, but one question, you probably remember this, they would always ask is something unusual about yourself that people wouldn't know. And so I'm curious, Carmen, what are some things that people wouldn't necessarily know about you if they met you for the first time? Ooh, interesting. Um, I think a big one that comes to my mind is that I was actually homeschooled um, growing up. And I think that's a, people have a lot of stereotypes about people who are homeschooled, but I, I had a really good experience. And so I think that makes me a little bit different. It gives me a little different perspective on life. And 
Let me let me see. Anything else interesting? My dad was actually in the Olympics, so that's kind of where our family passion for sports and working out comes from. Um, that's something I'm very proud of um, him for. And uh, do do I don't know. I collect plants at the moment, so I have a bunch of plants in my room. You can see my my big one in the corner. That's kind of my my newest hobby. So we've got a uh, botanist perhaps in the making. <laughs> a speech therapy botanist. There you go. I think you might be the first. <laughs> we'll see now, what happens. What event did your father compete in? And what year? Do you remember when he competed in the Olympics? Uh, yeah, he was in Barcelona in 1992 and he did shot put. Okay, I was five, so I probably <laughs> was a little young to remember that. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Uh, yeah, but uh, 92, I'm like, oh, geez, I was five years old. And then your dad, when he watches this, he'd be going, I wish I was five back then, right? <laughs> <laughs> I should probably watch myself. But that's really cool that he got a chance to compete. How well did he do? Do you remember? I think he got 10th place, um, which he was frustrated at, but... <laughs> <laughs> we're well, kind of a competitive family that really is a first world problem and i say that because recently i had a peggy odita hodel on she was the most distinguished contender in the female contender in american gladiators the original version but she tried Whoa. out she tried out a couple of times for the olympic team i think both to compete for the united states and nigeria she had dual citizenship she didn't make the team but she said it's hard to get a spot on the team and everyone i'm sure who's there if you get a chance to medal i'm sure your father had aspirations of making the podium and Oops, sorry <laughs> but you realize with how hard it is to make the team you have to go through trials so just to get a spot on the team and that's why i laughed not because your father placed 10th but he was frustrated and I get it. You're probably like this too. You want to go out there. You want to do well. But when you think about how hard it is to make the Olympics and how often they come around, would it be nice to have a gold medal? Great. But I mean, how many people- we're, we're, We'll keep them the way he is. <laughs> we'll keep them say, in the family. Right. When you look back on it, how many people are just hoping to get that chance to compete in an Olympics, let alone medal? So I'd say- I, I don't think you, I don't think your father's credentials are any less <laughs> distinguished or distinctive just because he got 10th in the shot put. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll keep him. <laughs> <laughs> I think so too. What would you tell a younger version of yourself with all the experiences you've been through, having to navigate through injuries and ha having to make the realization that you know, maybe you had to give something up in order to preserve your body for the long term. And with all the things you're learning as an aspiring speech pathologist about mental health and all of the anxieties that come with speech and mental disabilities, just with your life experience to this point and everything you've gone through, what would you tell a younger version of yourself? I think I would tell a younger version of myself to give, give myself grace and not just value myself for performing. Um, I think it's great to put everything you have in the moment into what you love, into athletics and pursue that. But at some point it might stop giving all of that love back to you. And I think having that core value in you as a human being good enough, you're just good enough the way that you are and you don't need to do anything to prove that to anyone. And I think that's something that doesn't get shared enough with athletes. And something else I wanted to touch on if it's all right with you, as we noted earlier, your mother, the team chaplain for the Minnesota Lynx and has held that spot for over 20 years. So you know, growing up with your mother, growing up with the team, getting a chance to meet with players who 
have this spirit rooted in faith. I know that's not everything about you, but it plays a big part in what you do. How do you think that has helped you get through obstacles, whether it was recovering from injury or when you got to a point where nothing, you know, nothing felt enjoyable anymore? Well, thank you for asking about that. Faith is definitely a really big part of my life. And I think a lot of the times we tend to treat God like a vending machine and we can pray and ask for a request, but if he doesn't give us what we want, it's easy to be like, mm, I'm not interested anymore. Um, so I think I've learned that that's not how God is and he's good whether we we feel like we're getting what we want in life or not. Um, I think I've really learned to that I don't have control of my life as much as I would love to. Um, and it's much easier to be at peace with that when you have faith and trust in the person that is in control. So that's definitely something I'm, I'm currently learning. <laughs> Never have it all figured out. Carmen, I was laughing because that is the first time I've ever heard the vending machine analogy get used. I didn't make it up. I'm not going to take credit. I've heard enough sermons that I, it, it was in the back of my mind somewhere. <sighs> But I think what you said is a good point. And again, this is an oral history podcast, so I love to explore every topic. But how often you know, do you see this, people asking for prayers? And I understand that too. And for me, it's like, that's not who I am. I don't like to draw attention to myself that way. It's like, if people want to include me in their thoughts, I'm happy about that. If not, that's okay too. Like, I can't control that. Mm -hmm but I do have the ability to make decisions and you know, just trust the process as you uh, hearing we say in sports all the time. And however you go about that process, that's up to you, but it's like, you're right. You, you don't, I understand why people do it, especially if they're going through a tough time. But like you said, it's not a vending machine. Things just don't magically happen. You know, sometimes you have to wait and sometimes, you know, what you ask for, you have to reach on your own accord. And that's not to suggest you're lazy. It's just sometimes it's your own intuition that creates those opportunities. So I think what you said is, it is a good analogy, but the whole vending machine concept, it's like, yeah, that, it's like, yeah, now that you mentioned it, and it's certainly not meant to knock on anyone who publicly asks for prayers or any kind of support, again everyone no, i has think to... i think it's good to share your heart with god and ask for what you feel like you want and need but i mean i would have asked for being able to play college basketball because that was my dream and that's not what god has chosen to give me but i think i just need to trust that whatever his plan for me is gonna affect more people and be better um than what i what i would have come up with so i think that's the, the, the most important part to take away. With your playing career now in the past, you, know, you still have a lot to look forward to, but what kind of future involvement do you see yourself getting in as far as sports go? That's a super good question. And I, I have no idea except that I'm totally excited about coaching my kids someday. Basketball, like it's it it has a little bitter taste right now in my mouth. But the one thing I can really look forward to is coaching coaching some little people running around. So and they could be your own, or who knows, maybe if you get approached to coach, that could be uh, your first uh your first practice run of what coaching little kids would be like, but uh and you know what? I, I'm glad you said that answer's still up in the air because there are no wrong answers on this podcast. And I think over time, maybe your attitude changes, but even now, you're, what you're telling me, I'm getting that glimpse already that I don't think you're going to be able to stay away from basketball altogether. <laughs> it will find a way to bring you back in. I think you're right, Mike. And we talked a lot about mental health as well. And then as I was going into my monologue, when you cut out, you know, speaking about all of the concepts, I don't know how much of that you identified with, but what are some things you've learned that have fascinated you in your speech pathology studies, learning about disabilities, communication 
impediments and things that we're going to have to contend with when this pandemic is over. They were with us beforehand. They will still be with us afterwards with you know, the changes in criteria for autism diagnoses, for example, you know, Down syndrome, stutters, all of that. When you have so many people and you realize this, you're worried about looking different when you're young, but as you get older and you realize with so many people, over 7 billion, well, that creates a lot of variance. So <laughs> something in the gene pool, like things will happen in the gene pool that you can't control. I'm rambling a little bit, but what are some things that have fascinated you that you think will help you move forward as you continue with your studies and your career ambitions? Well, I think a lot of times when people go into healthcare fields, you want you want to help people. You want to use your knowledge and skills to make their lives better. But I think just from volunteering and learning about um, different therapy methods, I think I realized that I'm probably going to be the one learning the most from the people I work with and how different doesn't mean worse, doesn't mean better. It's just different. And everyone, no matter their abilities, has something valuable to offer the world, 100%. And a lot of the times people with disabilities are able to love and connect in such a pure way. Um, that I think is really beautiful. And so I want to be a part of helping them express themselves and communicate and build relationships and succeed. Um, and also learn from how unique and wonderful their minds work. And I think I'll be really special to be able to interact with a bunch of different people. And I've thrown this question around a few times since I started following you and your athletic career, and you've never had a clear answer for this, and I don't expect you to, but just to have a little bit of fun, did you ever have a favorite Lynx player getting a chance to oh. meet them all? <laughs> you keep doing this to me, Mike. <laughs> no, of course not. <laughs> I and I wouldn't, and I figured that's what you were going to say because <laughs> I know you've been grateful to meet them all, and I don't know what kind of stories or moments you've had with them, but it sounds like you're grateful and excited that you got the chance to meet so many players. How do you think that inspired you or changed your perspective? I, I will ask you that because as you know, how many folks get to say, you know, you've gotten to meet Maya Moore, Lindsay Whalen, Sylvia Fowles, Simone Augustus, all of the names who have, been with the links for a long time or maybe just a year but you know you have an opportunity that so many fans would give up a lot to <laughs> share with you yeah I think just having those role models as I was you know a young girl and like you mentioned before sometimes being tall being you know taller than all the boys or really liking sports um it's hard to know where you fit in um I think just seeing all those strong, powerful women and being so successful and having fans and being respected in the world, I think that just really showed me that, you know, I, I had something to aspire to. Well, and that certainly won't change, even though you're not playing basketball. That perspective, that ideology will stick with you. And I'm just hoping it will be safe to gather in crowds again so that you can come back and check out some of the new faces we were talking before we started recording. You know, Maya may be gone, who knows if she'll come back, but now you've got Nafisa Collier, Crystal Dangerfield building up a strong core, uh, Jessica Shepard, who I know was working her way back from injury, Bridget Carlton, you know, the links have done well in the draft and now you've got Kayla McBride, Natalie Achanwa and Ariel Powers. It's not official official. She announced that she would join the team, but they haven't signed her yet. But yeah, for all the talk about if that dynasty was over or if their best years were behind them, I've got a feeling Carmen, if it's safe to attend games again, 
I could see you going back just to check out some of the new faces because I think oh, they're going to be sure. a lot of fun to watch again. Oh, yeah. I'll always be a fan of basketball. It'll be really cool to see what they can do for sure. And I'll leave you with this. What are some of your career ambitions? As you said before, you want to get into speech pathology, speech therapy. So how do you see yourself engaged in that role when you transition from your studies to making it a career? Yeah, well, that's, I think, a lot of unknowns, but I'll do a two-year master program um, to be able to practice speech therapy. And I'm hoping to figure out if I want to do like clinic or school settings. Um, but I think it'd be really fun to maybe have my own practice someday and get to, you know, specialize and work one-on-one -on -one with people. So big dreams, however I can help people, that's probably what I'll end up doing. So, yeah. Well, I have no doubt you will succeed in whatever path you take because what I get from you most is compassion, being mindful and respectful of others and acknowledging some of the challenges. I remember when you spoke of stuttering and some of the tropes and stereotypes that come with that and you were one to say, hey, this isn't something to trivialize, like this is a real issue that can wreak havoc on a person's psyche when they know what they want to say but have trouble articulating it and you know that told me like you understand there's a world out there that goes well beyond basketball and even if you had the chance to play with your teammates out at the Cole Center and on the road you understood that there's going to be a life after sports and your injury timeline may have hastened that transition a bit, but I can tell you're going to make a positive difference for a lot of people because you embody the spirit of kindness, uh, no matter who you talk to, no matter what challenges or conditions they're dealing with, you keep an open mind about it. And I have to give you props for that because not everyone shares that perspective as easily as you do. And well, Mike, thank yeah. you so much. Those kind words really mean a lot. It's been really, really fun talking to you today. Yes, yeah, so we'll have to do this again sometime. Uh, maybe when you come back or get into speech pathology or who knows, maybe if you take up coaching or broadcasting, we'll have to do this again. But I'm glad we got to catch up and hear about your story um, what it's like for athletes that maybe don't get to live out their dreams. Everybody, I think when, you know, you're young and want to make it in basketball, you have these visions. I'm sure you did hanging around the links for all those years of perhaps putting on the links uniform yourself one day. Unfortunately, you know, that won't happen, but not through your own doing, you can't control injuries, but from what I've seen, it took you some time. And I think you've stressed that it can and often does take time to come to terms with that reality, but you have. And I'm hopeful that other athletes who may be going through an injury that sets them back a season or goes through a situation where they're wondering, what is my value outside of sports? I hope that people will reference this podcast and your story to comprehend that you are far more than what your stat sheets, your records, your point totals suggest. Those are just numbers that doesn't speak to your character and your character, for lack of a better word, is strong. Thank you so much, Mike. Thanks for helping me tell my story. I appreciate it. Well, I'm always glad to share stories with you and I can't wait to get together again when it's safe. I know we always, uh, uh, enjoy uh, our interaction. So hopefully sooner than later, but uh, until then we'll do our best to stay safe. Sounds like a plan. Thank you, Mike. Well, thank you, Carmen Backus, who is continuing her studies at the University of Wisconsin. And hopefully we will see her soon as a practicing speech pathologist and who knows where she'll end up, but I've got a feeling she will go far. And if you want to be a guest on a future episode of this podcast, just contact us at the Mike Peden on Twitter or Instagram. All you need is a good story and we're happy to share it. So until next time, thanks for watching.